All right, guys, we're back at it again, looking at the book of Amos and trying to figure out what is God telling these people? What What is the diagnosis? What is the issue within Northern Kingdom Israel, within the city of Samaria? Then Amos comes to invite the people into repentance and lament. We have come to see quite a comprehensive view of the injustices that are happening within the society and what Amos and God are inviting as a response to that injustice. You have probably been told before if you're doing something wrong to stop doing it, right? We've all been there. And we know that there are things that we need to do that sometimes we just don't do. Have you, have you ever been that person? Maybe it's something that you think about as a New Year's resolution. You're like, I know this change has to happen. Maybe going a little more lighthearted, you're thinking something like, yeah, I've got to do my homework, but... Guys, there is a way to deal with rebuke and our spiritual state that looks a lot like laziness. It's called complacency. Douglas Stewart has such a, a keen view of this text, and he talks about this in his commentary on this passage. Two themes dominate the passage. Self-indulgence and self-confidence. So this picture of complacency that Douglas paints is one in which we are self-indulgent and self-confident. Has any of us ever been there? Yeah, uh, some synonyms perhaps. Let's take a look at this word complacency and explore the nuance of what's going on here. All right, let's take a look at this word in Hebrew, sh'anan, if you want to say it with me, sh'anan. All right, so in the Hebrew, this is carefree, self-confident, undisturbed. Obviously, in this context, we're talking about carefree. I do think it's interesting here that it is seen uh, quite negatively. Uh, if we look at the very bottom, I shall punish all who are ruined by complacency. Guys, this is a pathway to destruction. Don't be this. Don't be Shanan. So guys, this is being self-confident. It's being comfortable, secure, preeminent, at ease, right? It's this sense that I know I'm out of sync with God, but I'm good. I'm all right. I feel confident about that. Have you ever been there? So remember this word, guys. This is the word that gets reserved for some pretty sharp rebukes in Scripture. Whoa. I'm in a bubble. Can I move the bubble? I can move the bubble. Oh, my gosh. All right, guys. Um, here we go. Let's take a look at Amos chapter 6, if I can get to it. Woe to those who are at ease in Zion, to those who feel secure on the mountain of Samaria, the notable men of the first of the nations to whom Israel comes. Pass over to Kalna and see, and from there go to Hamath the Great, then go down to Gath of the Philistines. Are you better than these kingdoms, or is their territory greater than your territory? O oh, you who put far away the day of disaster and bring near the seat of violence, woe to those who lie on beds of ivory and stretch themselves out on their couches and eat lambs from the flock and calves from the midst of the stall, who sing idol songs to the sound of the harp, and like David invent for themselves instruments of music, who drink wine in bowls and anoint themselves with the finest of oils, but are not grieved over the ruin of Joseph. Therefore, they shall now be the first of those who go into exile, and the revelry of those who stretch themselves out shall pass away. The Lord God has sworn by himself, declares the, the Lord, the God of hosts, I abhor the pride of Jacob and hate his strongholds and I will deliver up the city and all that is in it. And if ten men remain in one house, they shall die. 
And when one's relative, the one who anoints him for burial, shall take him up to bring the bones out of his house, and shall say to him who is in the innermost parts of the house, Is there still anyone with you? He shall say, No. And he shall say, Silence, we must not mention the name of the Lord. For behold, the Lord commands, and a great house shall be struck down into fragments, and the little house into bits. Do horses run on rocks? Does one plow there with oxen? But you have turned justice into poison, and the fruit of righteousness into wormwood. You who rejoice in Lodabar, who say, Have we not by our own strength captured Carneum for ourselves? For behold, I will raise up against you a nation, O house of Israel, declares the Lord, the God of hosts, and they shall oppress you from Lebo Hamath to the brook of the Arabah. Whoa, it's not meant here a command to horses. Are you ever complacent in your spiritual life? We, church, is the church as a corporate, as a whole, as a family, are, are we ever complacent? Moving along, Stuart observes this. By thinking themselves first among the nations, the Israelites had gravely misinterpreted their situation in respect to Yahweh. So guys, do you ever feel like, like, yeah, I know, I know that I'm not quite what God wants me to be, but me and Jesus are tight, so I'm just going to keep doing what I'm doing. I think we've all been there to some degree at some point. Complacency puts us in danger. And I'm not trying to scare you or to question your security in Christ, that nothing can separate us from His love and that He's there with us. But if we're observing this Northern Kingdom Israel and its spiritual state that's that caused it to slide into this societal mess that did not reflect God well, I think we can watch for the warning signs of that spiritual state arising in us. So let's take a bit of a spiritual diagnostic. How would we summarize the spiritual condition of complacency? How can one get there to where God is warning them against something like coming judgment and they keep, keep on keeping on? Well, I think the answer comes here. It is in their pride. So guys, if you're comfortable, and I, I know we, I know this, this, this phrase is overused, like comfortable Christianity, right? Are you comfortable in your faith? But there's a reason that theme is so pervasive in conversations about faith in America. Because we see the same happening in ancient Israel. There's nothing new under the sun here. That we can get comfortable in our faith is no surprise. And that comfort and that security and that self-indulgent self-confidence, we can aptly name it pride. Is pride something that God even really addresses in the Bible? Okay, so we can see here, guys, that pride is such an issue that God calls it out quite frequently. So in this spiritual diagnostic, where are your places of pride? Remember this image of strongholds being this kind of symbolic image of pride we talked about earlier on in the book of Amos. And I think that's something to keep in mind. What are the things that we have built up that we're so proud of that might actually be keeping us from God? And so this is the danger of complacency and pride. Stuart has such a way of reading this text that brings it into focus. So let's read here. 
Israel had made justice and righteousness here, depicted metaphorically as food, into things to be avoided rather than eaten. The people have no taste for justice anymore. To them, it is odious when it should be sweet and desirable. Their attitude toward proper behavior and values is the exact opposite of what it ought to be. Guys, our tastes can be deformed by pride, by complacency, by comfort, by ignoring God. And when we encounter God Himself and the things that He cares about, we can actually assume that those things aren't good. Isn't this what the Pharisees did? Right? They studied about God and it and something happened in their spiritual state where pride was cultivated to a degree where the God that they read about and spent their lives reading about and thinking about, they spent their lives exploring the words of this God. And when He got there, when God the Son became flesh and dwelt among them, they didn't even recognize Him. Have our tastes been warped by pride? Have we developed a taste for things not of the Kingdom of God? I think that's a question worth asking in our spiritual diagnostic. You know, uh, just to go with the metaphor of food here, why don't we take a look at the fruit of the Spirit as compared to the fruit of the flesh. So how much of us celebrates those things, the wrong fruits, the wrong tastes? And how often do we not celebrate the good fruit? I think that's worth asking. You know what's interesting in this oracle, you know, we're, we're, we're trying to take it and, and use it as a spiritual diagnostic, right? Woe to the complacent. Am I complacent? God abhors the proud. Am, am I proud? And, and we're trying to assess ourselves as a individuals and as, as a group. Are these things in us? And the sobering reality of the text we're reading is that though Amos provided this opportunity for them to do the same thing. Remember, they were invited into lament. They were invited into repentance. We've seen what God does in the book of Jonah to the Ninevites, to people who are caught in this and they hear God's rebuke and His coming judgment and their hearts crumble into repentance and God relents. God relents from the calamity. So this story doesn't have to end this way. The, the, the story doesn't have to end with the destruction of the proud and the uprooting of the complacent. The story could end with the restoration of the humble. But here we have a picture of what is going to happen. And God describes this again in this covenant framework that Israel had with God. Disobedience fully manifested, fully committed to, fully lived out, separating from God, choosing death instead of life. That had a consequence. And the consequence was defeat. Let's explore the shape of this defeat. The passage opened with a series of place names that were actually under Israelite control at the time. Interestingly enough, this last verse about them being oppressed from Lebo Hamath to the Sea of Arabah, those are the exact places which Jeroboam II had regained for Israel. In other words, the places of their great pride and victory would be the places of their defeat. Stewart summarizes, within about three decades of Amos's prophecy here, the nationwide destruction and defeat prophesied in 6, 8 through 14 took place. 
The pericope links the coming horrors of war, however, not so much to world developments as to Israel's sin. Once again, the attention of the hearer, reader, is focused by Amos on the need for justice, righteousness, and on Israel's complacency and arrogance. The whole order of things was wrong. The society had adopted values and habits that were utter folly in the light of its covenantal obligations to Yahweh. As foolish as trying to plow a ledge with oxen, the country's pride in its fortifications and recent military success represented a horrible misappraisal of reality. What was really needed was a realization that doom was coming, that the conquerors would be conquered, and that the extensive territory of the nation would be extensively subdued by the enemy, yet unnamed and popularly unexpected. That being said, we don't find ourselves in the same historical situation. That's a reminder I've wanted to, to frequent. But as we chew on the prophecy of Amos, and as we learn about the character and nature of God, and his patterns of relationship with humanity, here's what we can conclude. The complacency and pride are the path to destruction. So if you're feeling lazy in your faith, if you're feeling like everything's good, you're self-indulgent, you're self-confident, whoa, whoa. And you know, Amos talked about the cows of Bashan, and I think maybe the modern day parallel might be Karen. Hashtag Karen. And whatever the male counterpart of that is, if you're feeling that way, and you're good, you don't want to engage the topics of justice or righteousness, you're just going to keep on keeping on, well, hashtag Karen, whoa, because there's hope. You know, (laughs) the caricature of this elite class of of women in Samaria just continues and it talks about what they were drinking out of. So a wine glass, you know, and we can look at an ancient wine glass. Well, the women in Samaria are apparently drinking out of the storage containers. You think this is a glass? (laughs) Bowl fulls of wine. Don't be a spiritual Karen. Don't be complacent. Don't be prideful. It's, it's that simple, right? So what is the alternative? Well, this word for complacency we talked about, it appears again in Scripture in one of our familiar psalms, the Songs of Ascent, Psalm 123. This is so cool. I can move this thing around. I'm in a bubble. To you I lift my eyes. O oh, you who are enthroned in the heavens, behold, as the eyes of servants look to the hand of their master, as the eyes of a maidservant to the hand of her mistress, so our eyes look to the Lord our God, till he has mercy upon us. Have mercy upon us, O oh Lord, have mercy upon us, for we have had more than enough of contempt. Our soul has had more than enough of the scorn of those who are at ease the contempt of the proud. So in our spiritual diagnostic, if we've determined, guys, that that complacency and pride exist and manifest itself in our lives, we probably all have some form of that. The alternative path is the path of a servant. It's the psalm talks about. Can we humble ourselves? Can we, can we put down the self-indulgence and put down the self-confidence and indulge ourselves and find confidence in in the Lord. That that He could be the source of our joy, that He could be the source of our hope and our confidence. It changes everything. When we depend on Him, when we trust in Him, when we let Him say what is good, and we believe Him in the things of God and the kingdom of God, we rejoice in and we follow out and our desires are transformed. We no longer want to inflate ourselves and boast about what, what we can do on our own, but instead we boast in Christ. The way of the servant is not one of joylessness as opposed to indulgence. 
it's not one of of uh, s low self-esteem instead of confidence that's not it it's the confidence and the indulgence in the Lord <laughs> Next time we're going to start to unpack some images, some visions that God gives Amos. And they're a little bizarre, but this is part of biblical prophecy. Pictures that help us latch on to what God is doing and help us understand how to respond to His redemptive motions. Alright, we'll see you then. Godspeed. <laughs>